Thank you, those of you on the platform. Let's show them this morning that we appreciate their efforts. Amen. This morning, uh, and uh, we are glad uh, to uh, be alive this morning, to be involved in all that God is doing on earth. How many of you are glad that you've made it to church today? This is the best place to be, uh, better than a five-star hospital. Amen. Or a five-star uh, prison yard. <laughs> James chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you, joyfully turn there with me. James chapter 1 is where I'm going to be reading from today. Uh, years ago, um, we had a young man in our church here. He's been um, attending services here for a number of months. His family, we are also in church. He had nothing much going for him. He had no job, no degrees, no skills. All he had was good looks. And so he had, when sharing his heart with me, he had dreamt of a day that he would relocate abroad where he doesn't know whether Ukraine, Somalia, anywhere. I just want to go. As time went on, one day we had a, a lady from our Waltham Forest Church uh, coming here, visiting us. We housed her in our home from the UK. And so whilst uh, this young man, uh, this girl uh, caught a glimpse of this handsome young man, instantly she fell in love with him. I tried to try and dissuade her, you know, he has destiny here. Leave him alone, but she wouldn't have none of that. Love was in the air. Convinced him, uh, and he yielded to who would not yield when somebody from UK comes and says, I love you. You will fall in love by force. Sooner they got married, they relocated to the UK. Both of them got their dreams. She got a man. He got to relocate. I visited with them. She started complaining of abuse, violence, something I had never seen in him whilst he was here. And then uh, the abuse led to violations, um, and uh, he was no longer satisfied with her. They got married, remember? I married them. She started, he started to abuse her. Today, as I'm speaking to you, I haven't had three children, one for another. They're divorced. They've been divorced now for maybe about seven years. The marriage didn't last. He has since remarried, haven't received his papers uh, and his status to stay in the UK. She's no longer married. She's in pain. But I warned her. In the text that we are going to read uh, this morning, there are desires that we all have that are God-given. And how we handle these desires tell a lot about what our future will be. In James chapter 1 verse 12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person would receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. We all need to write down on our foreheads. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire had conceived, takes incubating period. It gives birth to sin, 
And when sin has been fully grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. I want to minister this morning a message to just awaken us or to warn us and to equip us how to dethrone deadly desires. Amen. The first thing I'd like to consider with you this morning is our desires in itself. Desires are part of, part of God's gift. God gives us wishes. We, these are wishes that we have, longings uh, that we have, cravings perhaps uh, that we have. Uh, and because of this, it is very important uh, to note that not all desires are good for us. Not all longings are good for us. Not all cravings are from the Lord. For example, it is God that gives us the desire for intimacy. Say amen. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper. It is God that gives us the desire for acceptance. There is hardly a person here that does not want to be accepted. I have a desire to be accepted, to be loved, to be respected. These are godly desires. It is not sin. Listen carefully. It is not sin if you have desires. Desires have their place. Desires have their timing. Timing and place that are best for us. Problem begins when we allow our desires to take over our life. We become consumed by chasing after our desires. We become fixated in chasing after our longings. According to our text, in verse 14, the Bible says we can easily, all of us, can easily be led astray by our desires. There is hardly a person here that is immune from being sucked away by your desires. So the question I have is this. Why would something that God has put inside of us now threaten us to try and derail us? If desires are from God, why would he it now derail us? The answer is quite simple. The devil loves to tamper with whatever God gives. Good preaching. He wants to pervert God's plan for your life. He wants to twat God's intention for our lives. He tempts us with the same desire uh, and his aim uh, is that I will meet your desires. Uh, however, he's meeting our desires uh, at the wrong time and in the wrong way. This is what the devil does. Listen to what Songs of Solomon in verse 8, verse, uh, uh, chapter 8 in verse 4 says, it says Daughters of, of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or waken love until its proper time or place. He says, I know that you have love inside of you. I know that you have a passion inside of you. But keep it still until the right time and the right place. Am I connecting with you this morning? I know you want to express intimacy and affection, but there is a right time and the right place for all of that. The devil targets our desires and uses it for sin. This is what the devil does. He takes that which God has for us, and he turns it into sin. His aim um, is to twist our understanding. Uh, his aim uh, is to pervert what God has in store for us. Uh, you already are God's children. Uh, and he comes to you in a pervertive way and tries to convince you 
of other things. You know, this is what he did in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Innocence. He comes to Eve um, in a naive Eve way uh, and begins to pervert the views of God in our eyes. Genesis chapter 1. In verse 27 and 8, listen to what the word of God says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion on over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is God's intention for mankind. I'll create you in my image. I'll put something in my character inside of you. It's called dominion and subduing. You'll be fruitful and multiply. A few chapters later... In Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, listen to what, what had happened. God had spoken his intention. Lucifer comes along and he tries to undo what God is doing. Listen to what he says in verse 5. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate and also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. Listen, he uses similar words from the word of God and perverts it. They were already created in the image of God. How much more of God do you need? But he comes and says, God knows that if you obey my suggestion, you will be like God. It is not the likeness of God that was the most important. It was the creation of God that was most important. And then she begins to think about it. I want to be wise. She desired to be wise. And Lucifer supplied the tools to help meet her desires, her longings. Let me say it again. Not every desire that you have is from God. Yes, God has placed desires in you. One day to be married. One day to be happy. One day to be reunited. But it has to be God's way. Genesis chapter 2 in verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, um, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You don't need an addition from the suggestions from hell to be who God wants you to be. Oh, come on. I believe that God has a spouse for all his creation. Now, I know the world will say there are more women than men. I don't know whether they went around the world to count. We can't even count in Nigeria how many of us are here. But it's a way that, oh, well, there are more women than men. Every man deserves a second or a third wife. Uh, uh, after all, the only has 17. Well, what's stopping you? It says, uh, and the man shall be joined to one person and the two shall become one flesh. Now some of you are thinking of having multiple flesh. I know not in this church. Say amen. So I believe, young ladies, there is a man for you. I don't know where he is. You probably don't even know where she, he is. I don't know the timing because the Bible says it is not good to be alone. Oh, come on, somebody. I, don't be quiet on me now this morning. All right. It is not good. God does not do anything that is not good. And he created someone for you. The problem is that because you have a longing to be joined with another, 
we strip ourselves and join in the wrong way. My opening story, who knows who God had intended for this man and this woman. But they had to be joined and they did it the wrong way. There are so many unrighteous ways that people get their desires met. The enemy knows this. And so he has a way of offering us sin in order to get what we desire. I've heard people say, but pastor, oh God, put that desire inside of me. Yes, you may be right, but he put it there for a reason. He comes to Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus is hungry. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. No doubt he must have been hungry. And Satan comes and he offers him the desire of what he wants. He knows he needs bread. And he says, take this stone. You are the creator. You can turn it into bread and compromise. Many of us will be glad to do that. At least test our powers. Turn to bread. And he turns to bread. How I many of you know that's what the devil loves? Jesus rose above having his desires met for food. He comes with a desire for worship. Oh, you are the creator. You ought to be worshipped. But let's start with worshipping me. You are a worshipper. Worship me. But he refused because his desire has to be in line with the word of God. King Ahab, you know the story. He's looking out of the window of his palace. He sees neighbor's vineyard. It looks attractive. He desires to have that which belongs to another. And Satan made it possible by using his wife, Jezebel, to meet his needs. Jezebel gave Ahab what he desired because this is what the devil does. What about Potiphar's wife? She had longing eyes. This is desire, having longing eyes. She had longing eyes for Joseph day by day. And Joseph could have said it's a great opportunity at least uh, to go to bed with a very notable woman, uh, but he fled, uh, he resisted. Does it mean Joseph didn't have a desire for a woman? Heck no. I'm sure Joseph desired a woman, um, but this was not the person. And because he resisted the offers from hell, he was penalized uh, unjustly. But God never forgets. Say amen. When you make a righteous decision, doesn't matter how difficult it might seem to you at the time you're making it, no, I would not respond to that desire because it's from hell. God records it down. The enemy came visiting a man by the name of David. David is the king, uh, and uh, David uh, was uh, out uh, when kings had to go to war. David was walking on the uh, terrace of his home, uh, and he beheld another man's wife. And all of a sudden, there is a longing for him. David has a right to call any woman into his chambers, uh, but uh, this was not his own right. This was outside the perimeters granted to the king by God. And so he longed for another man's wife. And his desire for Bathsheba was met. But something died inside of David immediately. The Bible said that he lost dominion. He lost the ability to control himself. He went as far when the woman comes and says, I'm with child. He loves himself. He brings the husband back. He murders the husband. He lies and covers it up. But let me say this. God records it down. If your desire is to have what belongs to another, I declare to you such desire is not from God. If you are married and you're longing at a single girl, or a married woman, uh, that single girl has been assigned to a man. And that man isn't you. Amen. And so if you are one of those, you tamper with that, mark it down, God records it down. You will lose dominion. This is what God says, have dominion over this. 
Wanting our desires met must never override God's perfect will for our lives. And I believe that those that resist the devil's offer always have no use, or, or those that resist the devil's offer always have to use God's word uh, in order to overcome the devil's boundaries. There are boundaries that we should never cross. And sometimes someone that is spiritual is warning you. You don't like the way they're warning you. Your closeness to that person is unhealthy. You're crossing a boundary. Your involvement in those fraudulent people is not right. You're crossing a boundary. Revelation chapter 12, in verse 11, it says they triumphed. In other words, they had victory or dominion over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives uh, so much as to shrink uh, from death. Because we have desires doesn't mean that it supersedes the word of God. We must get accustomed to using the word of God to resist the devil uh, and to use the word of God uh, to meet our unmet desires. If we fail to do this, let me say this to you, the door of the demonic can easily be opened to you. If you fail to utilize the word of God, hell will target you because hell will offer you a way of meeting those desires. Proverbs chapter 27, in verse 20, the Bible says, death and destruction are never satisfied and neither are human eyes. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If all you're desiring is through the eyes, if you can't control it, then flee from it. So let's look secondly at the deceiving desires. Desires can become our king. This is a sad reality. It can become our passion. We can give all our energy to have our desires met. And I'm not talking about Sexual desires alone, there are myriads of desires uh, that we all long for. We can elevate the desires of our hearts, uh, the longings of our flesh, uh, and we can elevate them into a position of priority. Some people conclude, and I've heard people say that before, uh, that unless my longings are met, then I'm not a complete person. I've had people say, oh, pastor, I'm not complete. Something is wrong with me. And I say, why? Oh, I don't have a child. Something is wrong with me. Oh, I don't have a spouse. Something is wrong with me. Pastor, what's wrong with me? I don't seem to have a job. What's wrong with me? Beloved, nothing is necessarily wrong with you. Because when you start opening the door, trying to find out what is wrong with you, the devil will deceive you. He has a way of coming in. We begin to justify the means of getting our desires. Oh, it doesn't matter as long as I get what I want. We conclude that it doesn't matter how we get it. Getting it is what matters. All that matters, Pastor, is that I get what I want. And I've prayed about it. <laughs> I like it when we back it up with false spirituality. I prayed about it, Pastor. Okay. It seems as though when you pray about what you want, God answers you immediately. But when you pray about what God wants, you tell him to come back two weeks later. Good preaching. And so we, we you know, we, we say, oh, I, I, Pastor, it doesn't matter how I, it doesn't matter how I become rich. All that matters is I'm rich. Well, beloved, the mind, this mindset of justifying can become dangerous because you are being deceived. Oftentimes, this mindset is wrong. I know people that desire children. And it doesn't matter which, um, um, which doctor they go to as long as they have children. Good preaching. You know this. And I was joking one day that I'm dead. I'm dedicating a baby with a know where the baby come from, the baby, you know, you hold the baby, you want to dedicate to the Lord, and the baby's like, hmm. the baby's looking at you, hmm. <laughs> where did you get this baby from? <laughs> you don't know where people go and get what they want. Say amen. 
Some go to the mountain top and they give them a seed, put it under your tongue, and then a baby pops in your belly. And then you wonder, everybody, oh, absolutely, it doesn't matter, I've had a baby. Or you go, get a surrogate baby, sleep with someone else, pregnant day for me, I'm going to help my wife. And like, I've got a baby. At least my shame is covered. Be careful. Some people get money from strange sources. Today they are poor, tomorrow they are rich. And all of a sudden, they're just there. You know, they, are, they, love, they get a chieftaincy title, they get recognition, they get all this sort of thing. You don't know their source. They have a desire for wealth. They've just sacrificed their mother. In order to be wealthy, they gave up. You know, wouldn't it wouldn't be great if they say, give up your dog. No, they wouldn't ask for dog. They will ask for something there. And people willingly, joyfully, Outside of the will of God, they just do it. Other people, like in my opening story, people get married outside of the will of God. Not every man that wears trousers is, is going to be a good husband for you. Amen. Uh, you know, I ask people, I say, it's better. Which one is better, no man or half man? If I had to ask young ladies, which one do you prefer, no man or half man? Some people say, man, na man. Half man. Pastor. They get married, oh, pastor, she will be saved. She will start coming to the porter's house. She's going to respond to the altar call. But, you know, for now she's not saved. But we are unequally yoked. But it's going to be okay. No one in church wants to date me. So I go get somebody. And the Bible warns us, don't go and find one. If I know if is not in the Bible, but you know what I mean. I still don't know what if means. You just go and bring a half man and you present it to pastor. And you know pastor is just going to nod his head and the half man is pretending he's a full man. Like this man in my opening story. I know that doesn't apply to all of you, but others, job na job. You know there's some job that you should say no to. Come on. There are some jobs. Oh, pastor, I've been unemployed for so long. I've been scraping and scrapping all over the place. And I got this job. And pastor, I've got to do it. I'm tired of begging. Okay, let's believe God. Where is the job? Oh, the job is in Kukubungu. Where is that? Is the outskirts of Nasarawa? Why are you taking a job that for pastor? It's a job. I'm sure I'll be following you online. They seek for employment outside the planting of the Lord. Do you know God plants us where he wants us to be? And they go and plant themselves and transfer themselves. Uh, later on, they begin to blame. Pastor, <laughs> if I were to put church in everywhere that everybody has called me, I'll tell you, Pastor, we are suffering here. Bring a church, send a church here. I said, where are you? We're in Ouagadougou. Ouaga what? Ouagadougou. I said, if you had stayed in church, maybe we'll have planted you there. The list is endless. And you begin to build a case of justification around your longings, around your personal desires. Romans chapter 7 in verse 18 to 19. It says, and I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but that I do. Anyway, there are some people that the devil have lied to you that you are incomplete until your desires are met. That is a lie from hell. In him, we are complete. Say amen. In Christ Jesus, we are complete. Genesis chapter 30, in verse 1, a very notable scripture. Bible says that when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or I die. What is children going to do with your living? Uh, 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 
I am incomplete without a child. The people are scoffing at me and people are laughing at me. I'm going to die if you don't give me children. See, the devil, we make the devil's work easy when we start nursing how to meet our unmet desires. Listen to me tonight, today. Don't ever become obsessed with getting what you, what you want at the expense of losing what you need. We need a relationship with Jesus constantly. We sing that song, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. But not every, Paul's writing, what I need is not what I go for. What I want is what I find that I'm going for. And uh, we oftentimes, we say, I want this. Without these, I'm incomplete. And so we go for what we want and what we need the most, we lose. Be careful because desires can change you. Take over your actions and take over your life. Desires can deceive you. This is beyond logic. We become blinded by our unmet desires. And some certain lines that have been drawn by God, we begin to cross. Suddenly, you no longer have dominion. Suddenly, you lost control. And this becomes your new life. James chapter 1 in verse 15 this is our text. It says, uh, and when desire conceived, it gives birth to sin. Godly desire would not lead you to sin. It is the evil desires that when we are drawn away by these desires that ultimately lead us to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Death. Do not be deceived, my brother. Amen. So what the scripture is saying is that we can be deceived by our desires. We can become slaves to our desires. And I'm not talking about godly desires, but deadly desires, deceptive desires. And once you open the Pandora box of deadly desires, it cannot easily be quenched. One thing leads to another, and the aim of the devil is to take you out, to destroy you, and to kill you. And how many people look back today in regret because they pursued these deceptive desires at their expense of pursuing God? When I sat down with this lady, I pleaded with her. I became her enemy number one. My pastor, Pastor Brown, sat down with her in the UK, pleaded with her, don't do this. She begins to justify, I'm getting on in age. I want to have my own children too. I want to be a wife. I want to do this and I want to do that. Are you say, I'll, as a matter of fact, I would go back and live in Nigeria with him. It's not about coming to live in the UK. She lived in Nigeria to prove a point for three years. And after three years, yanked him out of here, relocated over there. And in another three to five years, they're divorced. Please do not be deceived. Life does not revolve around your desires, but our life revolves around Christ. First Timothy chapter 6 in verse 7 to 10, it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if you have food and clothing, uh, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Listen to what it says. Many foolish and harmful desires. One man said these words. The price that you pay for having your desires met is greater and can become disconnecting you from the Holy Spirit. The price of meeting your desire, yourself, your way, your time 
can cost you more than you're willing to pay. All of a sudden, uh, God withdraws himself from you. You could do whatever you want to do. But I would say he gave them what they desired, but he sent leanness to their souls. And oftentimes, people will look back in regret, how did I get here? What did I do wrong? You orchestrated and pursued your desire rather than God's desire for you. Psalms chapter 51, a notable psalm in verse 10 to 11. The Bible says, uh, uh, David is recounting, he's saying, they're creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. This is the one that I like. It says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He is now in regret, but Sheba has had a baby, first one dead, second one's alive. He's feeling disconnected from God. He goes to pray. He, his words are rising up and falling to the ground. He's trying to be good. He's lost dominion. His son is reckless. Amnon is violating the sacredness of, uh, of brotherhood and sister violates Tama all under his watch after he had done what he did. You open a Pandora box. Here is Absalom. He takes revenge of Amnon, slaughters him, runs away. The whole commotion is set in his family. He gets to the place of regret. He says, I am the one that opened the door, creating me a clean heart. My heart is filthy. Lord, help me. And I thank God. <laughs> I thank God that he loves when we are contrite in spirit. Say amen. God is a God of a second chance. Oh, have you ever fouled up? Absolutely. Have you ever opened the door that you should never have opened? The door of violations, a door of immorality, the door of all kinds of mess. If you'd come this morning, we serve a father in heaven. Who is able to restore? Say amen. amen. Who is able to renew? And you can be washed and made whole again. Say amen. amen. So let's look lastly this morning at the desire of delights. It is a great feeling and it's a great experience to have or to delight in our true desires. We can joyfully have what we long for if we choose to have it God's way. God wants you to have a wonderful life. Don't get it wrong. He's not against you. He wants you to have a fulfilled life. A fulfill he wants to fulfill your desires. He put them there. You can be saved again and you can have your desires met. Remember, it is God that put the desires within our heart. Imagine you can have good friends again. You can, have, uh, you can, you can love life again. You can have enough money. God's not against you having money, but in his way. You can have a joy that is complete. And this is not me advertising to you, come to God, you get this. No, no, this is true Christianity. Our God is a promise keeper. He said that I know the thoughts that I think towards you. So when I put the desire there, I put it there, for completion, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of good and not of evil. If we are going to get this, what God has put inside of us, then it means that we have something to do. So the question is, Pastor Glenn, what do I have to do to get what God has for me? Let's turn over to Psalms chapter 37. And uh, we want to read from verse 4. Two verses, actually. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, not in your desire. Delight yourself in the Lord, and then he shall give you the desires of your heart. He wants to do that. And then the clause is this, commit your way to the Lord and trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. So there are things that you have to do. Number one, you have to delight yourself in the Lord. You must be happy to be in the presence of God. 
You must be happy to sing to God. You must be happy to read the word. You must be happy to be around the things of God. Number two, you commit your way to the Lord. Oh, Lord, uh, this Ephulefu, is it for me or not? This job, uh, I'm not going to take it because it threatens to derail my relationship with you. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And I'm going to trust. Could you put that scripture back on, please? Uh, uh, and I'm going to trust in you also. We read about trusting the Lord with all of your heart uh, and lean not to your own understanding in all of your ways. Uh, acknowledge him and he will help you navigate the complexities of life. Uh, he will direct your path. But no, we know what is best for Pastor Glenn. You don't understand. The Bible says when he will bring it to pass. You will have that thing that you're longing for in God's way. James chapter 1 um, Listen to what it says in verse 17, the end part of our text. Again, this is very assuring. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or no shadow of turning. God does not say, I've got good things for you, but I'm going to make you salivate. I'm going to make you wait. I'm going to give all the people and I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to neglect you. No, he says, I have it for you. It's waiting for you. It shall come to pass. Amen. This morning, I don't change my thoughts. I don't change my opinion. When I've spoken it about you, I shall make it happen to you. And maybe you're here this morning. You can identify an area or more in your life that you have gratified yourself. Rather than allow God to direct your path. You look at yourself today, it seems as though you've lost dominion. You cannot pray the way you used to pray. You cannot sing the songs you used to sing. You cannot be around the people of God the way you used to be around them. You've lost dominion. You're losing steam. You're losing energy. You're losing jobs. You, you, all things are happening negative around you, beloved. I declare to you that we serve a God that can restore you. David had lost everything. He's no longer the David that he used to be. Joab is even threatening him. Joab had lost respect for David uh, until David said, oh God, you are a God that restores. Restore unto me that joy. I want to delight in your salvation. So the question this morning is simple. Are you willing to do things within the parameters allowed by God are you willing to control your desires? Are you willing to be restored when you delight yourself in the Lord? In other words, when you focus your attention on God, when you stop comparing yourself with others, when you start thinking, well, they've, they've gone ahead of me, they've done this and they've done that. Oh, they are here. They've got, oh, we all started together, but they've moved on, but not me. When you stop doing that, the sooner you stop doing that, the, the sooner you start seeing what God has for you. Because God has something for you. Say amen. God will bring his thoughts about you to pass. Wait on the Lord. When we make our desires align with God's desires for us, he will bring it to pass. I close the ability to defer your desires or your longings will always translate into the best enjoyment of your life. You don't have to get rich quick. Say amen. You don't have to, uh, uh, you know, get what you want, when you want it, how you want it, and however with whoever. This is what separates man from animals. I have dogs in my house. I know we didn't train them properly. But I have dogs in my house, even trained dogs. Animals, animals, ma human beings, most, like, what separates us is we know how to control our desire. If my dog wants to wee here, he's not going to knock on the door and say, Auntie Kemi, I want to wee. Can I wee? He just wheeze. 
If my dog wants to sleep underneath the car, he doesn't take permission. He sleep. Even, you know, when my dogs are on heat, uh, they don't ask our permission. Is he allowed? This is the pastor's house. This is a Christian home. Daisy is on heat. What do you think, Dad? Should I or should I? No, 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 no. Your dogs are dogs. You're not a dog, are you? We control our desires. Say amen. I know your desire wants to have it. <laughs> you want to, it makes me good. Wait for God. Once again, the price you pay for the desires that you keep or that you meet your way are heavier than you think. One man that we should always ask, ask David. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We want to bring our service to a conclusion. I said it and I'm going to say it again. It is not sin to have desires. Not at all. There are desires that God has placed inside of us. As a matter of fact, almost all desires... I just can't name them one by one are God-given. And they are good. You know why I say that? When he created man, he said, this is good. Every other thing is good. And he looked at man and said, this is incomplete. He would always desire something. So I'm going to provide that. And when Eve came on the scene, everything was perfect. But like ever before, Lucifer is the master at offering us an alternative to God's gifts. Deadly desires are one of them. So this morning, it's a great honor and opportunity to dethrone deadly desires. We're going to bring it down. We're going to cancel it. It's deadly desires that lead us to sin. When Lucifer spoke to Eve, he said to Eve, this desire God will give you. He knows that you desire knowledge and wisdom. He makes you wise, but he will not tell you that part of it. And because of that, sin was introduced. And you're sitting in this place, you wonder, how did I become a sinner? You were born in sin. You were conceived in sin. We were all conceived and born in sin. And so, this morning's message is an opportunity for you and I to say, God, restore unto me. Create in me a clean heart. Change something within me. I don't like the way this is. I don't like what I'm going through. I don't like the separation. A sin separates us from God. When we cry out in honesty and in repentance before God, He comes near us and we draw near to Him. God loves you. Hence, He will have taken you out. It is love that sustains us. And as I minister to you this morning, you recognize that somewhere your heart has been separated from the love of God. You've done things you should never have done. Paul wrote about that. You've been places that you should never have gone. You associated with people you should never have associated with. And you look at your life this morning and you wonder, oh God, is there hope for me? Is there help for me? Is there possibility of a renewal for me? I declare to you the answer to that question is yes. And if God be for you. And he is for you. To help you. To renew you. To restore you. But it has to be your own decision. I'm going to dethrone deadly desires. 
I'm going to pull down the altars that my sin has erected. I'm going to be honest with God. He already knows who you are. He's got a record of all our deeds. And he's waiting this morning and wondering, would you be honest enough that he might just wipe all our sinful deeds and desires, wash them with his precious blood, and whisper into your heart how much he loves you and how available he is to restore you. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you're coming from. What matters is that would you dethrone deadly desires. As I pause for a moment, Christians are softly praying. Maybe God's spoken to your heart that you're not clean, you're not right, you're not saved, you're not born again. Or perhaps you did this some time ago. You surrendered your life to Jesus. But you yielded to temptation. You said yes to Lucifer's offers. Your heart is heavy. But I declare to you that God still loves you. If you'll be honest with him, backslider or unsaved this morning. I'm going to ask you to do something simple but the devil will whisper to you not to do it but I'm telling you by doing it is an indication that you're ready to dethrone deadly desires and if that's you this morning you raise up your hand you say pastor please pray for me I'm not saved I'm not right with God anyone at all would you raise up their hand come on lift it up high lift it up don't be ashamed come on raise it here's my hand preacher I want to come back to Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to be right. I want to be restored. Restored, David said. And as soon as David said those words, Jesus assured him. By the time David breathed, breathed his last, the Bible said that he rested with his fathers. We serve a God in heaven that is a restorer. One last call. I'm not going to hold this much longer. You've heard what I said. Now it's for you to make a decision. Preacher, here's my hand. I want to come back to Jesus. I want to be saved for the first time. Here's my hand. Lift it up high. Let me pray with you. Amen. Christians, let me now speak to you. Be careful. Be very careful. Not every gift is good for you. The good gift comes from above. The perfect gift comes from above. I desire things in my life and they are not necessarily evil. But I can't fast track the meeting of my desires. I can't forcefully get those things that I want. I've got to wait on the Lord. It doesn't matter who you are. Make your requests known to God. Tell them. Tell him, God, these desires that I have, are they from above? Are they right? It doesn't matter. He never forgets us. We are going to open these altars to find a place of making peace with God. Maybe you've allowed your desires to consume your mind. Every time you pray, it's about give me a job, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job. Me. That's the only thing that you're thinking about. The Bible tells us that we seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And every other thing that we crave for, we long for, we desire to have shall be added unto us. These altars are open. Let's all stand together. Let's find a place to pray. Come on, let's all stand together. Come on, let's all stand up. Let's find a place to pray this morning.
come on, it's not wrong to 